Hi, I'm Tatiana McFadden, 17-time Paralympic medalist and proud new champion of Project Play. Welcome to the fourth and final day of Project Play Summit, the nation's premier gathering of leaders building healthy communities through sports, where we take measure of our state of play and take the next steps in making sports accessible to all youth, regardless of zip code or ability. Today, we will examine the role of parents in shaping the environments which children play. I know how influential parents can be. When they helped me get into my local parasports club when I was just seven years old, they drove me every single weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just to watch me play sports four to five hours a day. By them taking me and driving me to the sports program for the first time, it allowed me to dream big and it allowed me to dream of what I wanted to be when I grew up and that was to be a Paralympic champion. Today's session will also explore the story we want to tell, that we can tell by the 2028 Olympics and Paralympics in Los Angeles and the role of the Olympic movement in helping grow sports participation nationally. To share more, let me introduce Tom Ferry, who can walk you through the day. Tatiana, thank you for supporting our work, not just during the summit, but with Project Play broadly, including as a member of our school sports advisory committee that will help us identify the best school sports models in the country. As Tatiana noted, today we will examine the shifting forces that shape the behavior of perhaps the most influential stakeholder in the landscape of youth sports, parents. I've made this point before, that the moment you have a child, your favorite athlete is no longer LeBron James or Serena Williams, Leo Messi or Bryce Harper. It's the athlete down the hallway. That's who you invest in, emotionally and financially. Your own child athlete is whose playing time you most monitor closely, whose treatment by refs bothers you the most, who you trade stories about with friends at backyard barbecues. This generally comes from a good place. You love your kid and you want them to succeed or at least not be eliminated, culled from the herd. You want that more than anything else in the world, really. We're talking about the stuff of DNA evolutionary code. If you can afford the arms race that has become youth sports, it's hard not to go with it. Even our next speaker, one of our society's great thinkers, felt the tug. Wikipedia describes Michael Lewis as an American author and financial journalist. Full stop, no mention of sports. We know better. His books and movies have been among the most influential in sports. He wrote The Blind Side on the evolution of modern football and the class dimensions in the college game. And Moneyball, which called BS on a century's worth of collective wisdom by baseball insiders and helped usher in the era of statistical analysis. Michael is my kind of writer. He takes complex topics that have reshaped key American institutions or American life itself and unpacks them, makes them understandable to a wide audience through vivid storytelling and characters. In his latest project, he's the central character. His topic mines the same ground as Project Play, youth sports. It's called Playing to Win, an audiobook released this week on Amazon Audible that explores the psyche and social impact of the travel team parent, a force that has transformed sports at all levels and the lives of families everywhere. Here's how he opens up the two-hour audiobook. Last summer, my wife sent me a text message. she just dropped off our child at some softball field in Oregon and gone looking for a gluten-free meal in a gluten-filled mall when she experienced what must have been a terrible moment of clarity. She saw what kids' sports had done to our lives. This is hell on earth, said the text. There is no reason for me to be here doing this. And with that, she was done. Right up to that moment, as a mother, she'd been willing to do pretty much whatever it took. No drum lesson was too much trouble to reschedule. No play date too distant to drive to. No homework assignment trivial enough to ignore. But this, well, it was all finally too much. 
if I wanted our child to continue her athletic career, I'd have to manage it on my own. A part of me was surprised that it had taken so long for her to break. 1,610 girls' softball games. I counted them up. In the beginning, a decade ago, before either of us had any real idea where our children's athletic careers would lead us, most of their games were fairly sweet-natured affairs played no more than an hour's drive from our home in Northern California. In time, they became a lot less sweet and a lot more distant. In just that past year, our 16-year-old daughter had played softball in Portland, Denver, Las Vegas, Orlando, Boston, Yaphank, New York, Middletown, Connecticut, Princeton, New Jersey, and two small college towns in western Massachusetts. She'd spent 27 nights in hotel rooms in Irvine, California, and become an A-list member of Southwest Airlines. If all you knew about her was her itinerary, you might guess that she was an overworked salesperson for a mid-sized American company based on the West Coast, but a company with peculiar national ambitions. 1,610 softball games sounds excessive, but it really doesn't capture the enormity of the experience from my wife's point of view. You'd need to include another 2,000 team practices, plus another 1,000 or so private batting practices, pitching lessons, and weight training sessions. A home movie scrolls through my wife's brain of the life we might have had had it not been for sports. In this movie, our family is more like an American family from the 1950s. We spend weekends together. We're able to use the tickets she bought four months in advance to go see Daniel Handler reading Lemony Snicket instead of giving them away and flying to a softball field in the Denver suburbs. We're allowed to vacation at times other than the few weeks in August between the summer and fall softball seasons. And we'd devote not so much as a passing thought to which Hampton Inns offer a cold breakfast before six in the morning on Sundays. I just assumed as a family that we'd have dinner together, she says, as this movie sadly rolls along. We can't even pull that off once a week. Walker still doesn't know how to use a fork. Walker is our 12-year-old son. I completely understand why my wife now feels as she does, and even if I didn't, she's earned the right to feel however she feels. But I have my own feelings about the situation. One night, not long after she returns from the softball fields in Oregon, I tell her that the time has come for me to sit down and try to make sense of them, to examine this strange new force at the center of American culture that has not only reshaped millions of families, but change the way fathers view their daughters and those daughters view themselves. She just looks at me with suspicion. Don't sugarcoat it, she says. Irvine, California is where I met up with Michael in the spring in the very last tournament for his daughter Dixie before she moved on to college softball at a top D3 school. He had reached out to me as part of his research, counting practices and private lessons The game that day was more like Dixie's 3,600th exposure to the game. That's as many days as she had lived since first grade. It was, um, it was excessive. And the reason I got in touch with you was, you know, I was groping, uh, you know, I didn't realize that anybody had grappled with the subject until I, and someone pointed me your way. Um, But then the subject was just how different the experience my daughter was having and my son is having playing basketball than I had when I was growing up as a kid with sports and just how extreme and excessive it had all gotten. Um, And I just thought while I was wrapping this up, I had two thoughts actually. One was I'm going to get some of my money back by writing about this. (laughs) And, and, and the other, the other was I really want to document it because I think it's, 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 it's an aspect of American life that consumes some large number of American families and nobody really ever talks about it. They talk about it with each other if they bump into each other or if they happen to be in the same sport and that sort of thing. But while CNN and MSNBC and Fox is nattering on all the time 24 seven about federal politics, um, actual Americans are obsessing about their kids' lacrosse career. 
and and that that's what interested me. It got, that's what kind of got me thinking. I, I ought to write this up. I had to write this up to kind of figure out what's what's going on here. And what did you what did you learn? What was the core of that obsession? All right. Well, let, let, let's start with this. That it's the 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 way we kind of slid into it. Like I live in Berkeley, uh, and Ber we 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 this environment is a kind of a collaborative, non competitive sports environment. The sports leagues are are not designed to create college athletes. And I happen to have a child who is talented and she found her way into the world where you are competing with other kids for the attention of college coaches. And um, the minute we ha hit that world, um, the experience became a mixed blessing. There are really good things about it. I'm not gonna, there are things I really quite enjoyed. I mean, as, as grueling as it sounds to spend, you know, 20 weekends a year in a Hampton Inn in some godforsaken town in some remote part of America, you're with your child. And, uh, you know, the, the sort of a force enforced uh, interaction with, with parents, which is kind of, which was fun. But the minute she hit um, the really competitive strain of softball, it ceased to feel like play. It ceased to feel. It's. It, it. It. It was fun in the way that you know professional sports are fun for the people that play it, but more. But it was more much more like a business. And what was you know at the core of the, there were I think there are a couple of things at the core of this obsession. It was obsession. It was obsessive for all the parents. It was obsessive for all the kids. Um, obsessive to the point where you know teammates are kind of slightly hoping each other ill so they can get on the field. Obsessive to the point where, you know, parents are angry and screaming at coaches and screaming at umpires and, you know, obsessive to the point where it just seemed like not entirely happy all the time. Um, the first answer to the question is everybody's competing for a scarce resource and a scarce resource is a college scholarship or less often spoken of a slot at an elite college that you get to that you wouldn't get otherwise uh, because you're an athlete. Um, that's the that's the explanation everybody gives. You talk to the parents and say, oh, you know, we got to do this because, you know, Betsy Betsy really wants to, she really needs a scholarship. But if you back away from that, it actually it was not. It's a pretty thin excuse for what's going on, because the you know, the average scholarship in college softball is I don't know what it is. It's like I, I, I forgot. Let's say it's like ten thousand dollars a year, something like that. The parents are forking out. 20, 30,000 bucks a year for their kids to compete, to, to get to, to even get to the point of getting the scholarship. They just took the money that they were spending on their kids' athletics career and put it in 529 plans. Uh, they would come out so far ahead uh, than, they, than where they end up with a partial scholarship playing in college. The money, so the money, the money argument was just, I found, was just a, a, a cover for what was really going on. And what I think was really going on was um, this odd sense that you could tick the box of I'm being a good parent uh, by, by, by diving into this world, you know, you know up to your eyeballs. And, um, and this also this sense that your job as a parent is to help your kid win a brutal red and tooth and claw competition. If your kid's a, if your kid's a good athlete, therefore means that you're a good parent. That, I, there's something, something like that's going on. Uh, and it starts, especially it means you're a good dad. It's the dads are the ones who are heavily, you know, it, it's, it's always a dad whose career didn't quite work out. You know, his, his athletic career isn't quite what he hoped. Or a dad who just got, you know, in my case, I, I think my case is a pretty typical case. A dad who's, involved but certainly not doing 50 percent of the parenting when child hits daughter hits age six and there's this thing that i'm uniquely qualified to take 100 percent of the responsibility for and my wife says thank god there's something you know go do it and it becomes this slippery slope it starts as oh it's fun it's 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 daddy and daughter going off to the park once a week or then twice a week and then daddy's coaching the team and then he's coaching two teams and then he's running the league and then he's on the board and then and then he's he's coordinating all the travel softball teams in the area and his kid's a superstar and dad's like 
entire identity starts to become wrapped up in how his kid's doing. That was me. Uh, you know, I, I was spending at the peak for a period of six, seven years, I was spending 30 hours a week as a softball coach or they call me commissioner, of, but as the organizer of the, our, our competitive travel teams here. And um, that's easily 30 hours a week. As much, I mean, I was supposed to be writing books, right? I was spending about as much time on my kids' athletic careers as I was on my own literary career. And you, you think, and I'll tell I tell a story in the, in the little piece you mentioned where I, it didn't, how crazy the story is, is it didn't occur to me there was anything strange about it until I mentioned it to someone else. I was off with Obama. I was writing a piece for Vanity Fair about the president of the United States. The president of the United States had flown me with him down to Cartagena, Colombia, and it spent a lot of time with me on Air Force One, time with me down there, was really helping me with the piece. And um, was kind of into it. And we, we land back, we actually landed up for some reason, not at Andrews Air Force Base, but at Dulles. I can't remember why. And as we're getting off the plane, he says, you know what? Don't go home yet. Come get in the, in the beast. That's, his, that's the limousine. And I'll and ride with me at the White House. Come check out the White House. And, and I said, I looked at my watch and I said, I got a tournament. I got a softball tournament. I got to get back to to supervise it in California. And I got to get on a plane and get out of here. And he, he kind of smiled and said he understood. And I got on a plane. I came back to supervise a 10-year-old girls softball tournament. And it was like nine months later, I mentioned that, you know, I said, someone, you know, I really probably should have gone to the White House with Obama. It probably would have improved the peace. It would have, I got to know him better. They said, why didn't you? I said, well, because I had the softball tournament to come back to. They, you out of your mind? But, but I was doing that kind of thing. I mean, that's extreme, but that kind of thing, routinely. Yeah. Don't be more powerful than, than the president of the United States. Yeah, the feeling it was like, your daughter and, uh, and the thing that was going on in my brain is I don't want to miss that. No way I'm going to miss that. She's going to be a star. She's going to, be, you know, it's going to, they're going to, they're going to kick ass. It's going to be so much fun. I'm not going to, I'm not going to miss that. Um, and it, it, it's, it becomes, my wife said for a period of time, she thought it had actually changed my brain chemicals. Now what she was seeing was a version of me when I played sports. Uh, and I, it was joyous for me, but it got out of hand. Let's talk about the economy, the youth sports economy a little bit here. I mean, you went to the London School of Economics, you worked on Wall Street, you've written about you know, rigged economies, the housing bubble of 2008, you studied behavioral finance. What do we need to know about the youth sports economy? That at the bottom of it is the ignorance of the consumer, the ignorance and delusion of the consumer. The consumer is the parent of the of the child who is uh, having to pay, you know, sometimes ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars a year to keep a kid in the travel softball or travel baseball or travel basketball world. Um, the 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 consumer, the parent, in this case, me typically only knows what they need to know to be intelligent in their, in their decision-making after they've gone through the experience. And they typically only go through the experience once, maybe twice, maybe three times if they have three kids who are gifted athletes. But this isn't a repeat thing. This isn't like, this isn't like going to a restaurant. You're, you're, you're not learning. They, or you are learning, but by the time you learn, it's kind of too late. So the ignorance of the consumer and the anxiety of the consumer is at the heart of the whole thing. The anxiety of the parent who's paying the money. The, my observations, one of the things that shocked me was just how willing people who had no resources were to hand over every, anything they had for the sake of their kids' athletic careers. Um, I watch parents um, drive eight hours to a softball tournament and sleep in a tent they couldn't afford a, a, a Hampton Inn hotel. Um, the, the people take out loans. People, people really bankrupt themselves for this thing. So that's at the bottom of, of, the, of, of this whole market. And if you can almost look at it like a, a market for addictive drugs, uh, that, that, the, that the behavior of the consumer is a bit like that. Um, 
So uh, built on, on that foundation, this foundation of an endless supply of anxious parents willing to cough up whatever it takes to give their kid an edge in this hyper-competitive world, is a mix of toxic and benign characters and actors. Um, they're really good coaches. They're really bad coaches. They're really horrible travel uh, sports organizations. They're really good travel sports organizations. The, the ability of the consumer, the parent, to sift among them is, 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 uh, is very weak. They, they, you, you, when you're shopping for these organizations, you really, there's just not a lot of good information. It's word of mouth, cat, anecdote, uh, it, a lot of unreliable stuff. Um, so the market doesn't sort the good from the bad. Uh, because the consumer doesn't sort the good from the bad. So there's nothing driving out the bad softball tournament organizer or the bad coach. Um, and there's nothing like lifting the really great tournament organizer or the really great coach or the really great travel travel organization. No, it's uh, like there's a lack of like, like clear quality standards that a parent can say, well, right. evaluating this organization, are your coaches trained in these key competencies? Do you have uh, risk of, you know, assessment insurance? Are you abiding the principles of the American development model? I mean, it's like parents don't, they don't even know, they don't even know where to start. They don't even know where to start. And where they do start, they don't even start intelligently. Where they do start, let's just take softball, but I'm sure it's representative of all of the sports, is they go on the website of the travel organization and they see the pictures of the little girls who have been committed to college. And, and they say, oh, look, they got a lot of girls into college. And, and they don't know, first, they don't tend not to evaluate the quality of the college the girl went to. And they have no ability to know whether that's better than what the girl would have done without the softball organization. Uh, two, they don't know the financial terms of any of it. Like, did the girl get a scholarship? Did they get, you know, she a walk on? None of that stuff. Um, and, and three, you never see all the girls who never get to a college at all. Uh, so you, you get really weak anecdotal information about the thing about only one of the things you're paying attention to um and and so the ignorant when you're in a market with an ignorant consumer you're in a market that's pr that's primed for chaos and pr and primed for exploitation um and is inefficient it's not the the, the 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 ignorance of the consumer means the market can't correct uh and that's what it felt like to me it's like the market can't correct now you could, if you could introduce information, like if there were rankings or ratings or some minister of sport who came along and, and said at least a seal of approval or not seal of approval, like, like a health inspector goes in and says, it's okay to eat in this restaurant, you're, you know, you're not gonna be poisoned. Um, the, the, that, that would have a big effect. Um, they would, then you'd, have, you'd at least have some information and, and a mechanism for at least driving out the more toxic actors. But let's just move on because th that's just the level of consumer buying um, the product of travel organization and coach. At the next stage, the travel organization has to, has to negotiate its way into the tournaments that are most uh, attended by college coaches. And that is a whole nother hairball. Uh, that you've, got, you've got tournament organizers who lie about how many college coaches are going to be at their tournament, and nobody knows. You know, you kind of maybe they were there, maybe they weren't. Um, you have tournament organizers who bribe college coaches to come to tournaments when the college coach has no interest in any of the kids there. They're just being paid to, to show up in their college stuff and seem like they are looking for athletes. Um, you have tournaments where there are legitimate, you know, college recruiting showcases, but there are actually 40 fields and only two of them are really where the college coaches are and 38 of them are of no value whatsoever. You want to be um, on the good, the good fields. The That's good fields. And, and, and there's no way for a parent to navigate this. Um, so it's a, it's a market that's broken is what it is. Uh, it, it, is it does, it's like a, um, you know, it's a market for lemons. There's a, there's a famous George Akerlof paper called The Market for Lemons. It shows the way a market fails when there is um, 
asymmetry of information between buyer and seller. He was talking about the used car market, but there are a lot of markets like this. Um, the subprime mortgage bond market was like this before the, the financial crisis. Um, the difference is there's, there's no obvious, because it's fueled by these emotions, these highly irrational emotions, the emotions of the parent for the child, it's a little hard to see how it self-corrects. Like the subprime mortgage market was eventually gonna crash. Eventually someone was not gonna pay off their mortgage and the things were gonna be revealed as valueless. Eventually the used cars, you know, um, used cars gonna, gonna, you know, die on the highway and word is gonna get around that the used car dealer is you gotta be careful. Um, it doesn't work that way with this. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a, it's more resistant to the um, positive effects of market forces. And, and to, your the, to your larger purpose, like who's supervising this? Like who says it's okay? Um, who says it's okay to force 25 softball teams uh, from, from the Bay Area, from Northern California, to fly to Colorado to play each other? Uh, and, and spend a fortune and bankrupt families and like, why, where, why does that make sense? Uh, or who says it's okay that you basically weed out all kinds of kids who should be playing because they can't afford to play? Uh, that it becomes an actually economic competition that, as much as an athletic competition. That your ability to pay uh, means that you have access to this this privileged relationship with college admissions offices or this privileged relationship with college scholarship money. Um, it's just the opposite of what it should be. It sort of be, should be, you know, sports should be a leveler. It should be a, it should be a way for kids to come from nothing and emerge as, you know, champions. They should, they, they should, it should be a way to identify kids who have ability to work hard, who have ability to succeed in tough environments. Uh, who have no resources uh, and get them into places with resources. That, that's, but it's become the opposite. It's become, it's become essentially a, re, a regressive uh, rather than a progressive um, enterprise. And that, that, that was always, that was the part that I liked least about it. And that was, I don't know about you, but it was the part I, I maybe liked most about my own athletic career was the way it threw me out of, I grew up in New Orleans, out of privileged New Orleans, and threw me into all of New Orleans, and black and white and poor and rich and Catholic and Irish and uh, and you and you were with you were competing. Nobody cared who your daddy was, uh, and and that's in the world of travel sports, that's gone uh, because it may be true nobody cares who your daddy is once you're there, or your mama is, but to get there it matters who your mama or daddy is. Uh, and that's that's just a shame. How should we? I mean, how should we feel about that? Or what? Or, or more to the point, what should we? What should we do about it? Or what? what that's can a we really good question. You have the answer to that. I don't. But that's called boomer asking. When you ask the question that the person should be asking you, so I should be asking you that question. Uh, but I'll I'll take a little stab at it. Um, the the people who could do a lot are the college coaches. The college coaches could insist on on seeing on 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 the importance of high school sports, uh, on the on the places on seeing the places where the kids who don't have the resources can play. Um, that's and they could do it at a local level, and I think some of them do. Um, Heather Tarr, who coaches softball for the University of Washington, had a lovely conversation with her. Never ended up in the story. But she said that at her local level, she tries to do for really little kids kind of clinics to sort of identify kids who might not have resources, but might get it, somehow get them into the pipeline. Um, uh, so college coaches could have an effect. You, could, you know, if there were a ministry of sport, I mean, this is all crying out for regulation, it, it basically, I think, in an age that hates regulation and that, and that doesn't really understand its value. Um, doesn't understand that every market that really works is a market that's re well regulated. Uh, and this is a market that doesn't particularly work very well. If the kid all of a sudden can't afford to play when they're 10 
and that, you know, they can't afford to travel to Colorado from California to play in the tournaments. By the time they're 12, they can't compete. So you got to start really young. But the, to, to sort of create, try, what we need to do is change the culture. So there is a sense that if you have a travel program and you've got 18 little girls on a team, that four or five of them really should be on scholarship. Uh, that there, sh there should be, a, 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 you should either, yeah, it should be, maybe this, maybe we think of these, these things should be priced like airline seats, uh, you know, kind of your ability to, to pay. And, um, but it's, uh, my, how I feel about it is outraged. I, I mean, it does feel like you're taking this thing that really has nothing to do with money. And there's so few places in our culture that have nothing to do with money. And sports really should have nothing to do with money. And turning it into something that has a lot to do with money. Uh, it's the last thing the society needs. It needs more things that have nothing to do with money, not fewer. That if you insist on the localness of it um, and, and you, you force it, you sort of try to encourage it to be local for as long as possible, you solve a lot of the problems. Because expense comes when you hit the road. That, that's the expense. Uh, that the big expense. That's when kids start getting weeded out when they have to get on an airplane or go pay for a hotel room. So you insist on these, you, you invest in these local leagues. And if these local leagues are strong, they hold the kids into their 11, 12, 13. And at that point, when they're 13, they can get, you get them a 13. If you don't have any money and you can play, someone's going to see it. Um, you, you're, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna be lost because you don't have the money. That, at, at that point, you know, someone will pluck you out. But um, the problem is that what happens in a lot of communities is that it's not, the community is not that strong. And all of a sudden the kids are off at age nine and 10, uh, you know, frequent flyers on Southwest Airlines. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's, that, that's a big problem. The, uh, do you think that'll change at all? I mean, we have seen over the past few months, hundreds of college programs get cut across the country. Just yesterday was, uh, was Minnesota, got rid of three or four programs, Iowa a week before that, Stanford cut 11 programs, Ivy League schools, D2, D3. I mean, it's been a bit of a bloodbath and a bit of a reset in college sports these days. So as that happens, and as programs, including softball programs, uh, get cut. Does that change the uh, the value proposition or the potential ROI that can motivate parents to get their kids on these early forming travel teams and spend all the money and spend all the time? I'm sure it does. Um, it, it certainly removes it removes the official. It, it lessens the power of the official story, which is we're doing it for college scholarships. Um, it doesn't remove some of the core emotional reasons why people are doing it in the first place. Um, so I think that the world of youth sports is gonna die a harder death than the world of college sports. I think you may find that some of these programs get cut back and in the first, in the, in the, your, the first response in the, in, the, in the youth sports market is nothing. They're gonna go back to right, where, right to where they were until people figure out what, what all that meant. Also, it's a little hard to know what's temporary and what's permanent. Um, this, is, this is a very odd period. Um, it's, it's, it's a little hard to know what will be cut permanently and what won't be. But let's say that there is a, I can't remember what the numbers of dollars are for college scholarships, athletic scholarships, say $3 billion a year, just pick a number. Um, let's say that's reduced by a third um, or half. I don't think it will have an equivalent effect in the youth sports market because I think the youth sports thing is, do, is there's something else going on there above and beyond this college scholarships dollars. And as long as there's any kind of story, as long as there are any dollars out there, you can still tell the story we're doing it for the, do, for the scholarship dollars. Um, so unless they just eliminate, so let's take softball. Let's say they just eliminated college softball altogether. It didn't exist anymore. It's not going to happen because it actually makes money. It's like one of the, it's the, it's the, it's the woman's sport that I think does well. It's on ESPN all the time. And, um, but let's say they just eliminated it. Uh, it would, it would deal a big blow to the youth sports stuff. I, it would not completely kill it. Um, because other, because there are people doing it for other reasons. Michael, thank you for joining us.
Sure. Total pleasure. So welcome, everyone, uh, to our session called Where Did the Incentives Go? You know, youth sports has been reshaped by the chase for the uh, NCAA team roster spot, with parents investing in private training as early as grade school in hopes of a downstream ROI for their child. Since COVID-19, colleges have cut hundreds of programs, moving many to club status. This session explores where the trend is headed and asks, how will youth sports be impacted? How can colleges help center the model more on the values of health and inclusion? We have an incredible panel of speakers to uh, explore this topic with you. First, we have Brian Hainline, Chief Medical Officer of the NCAA, and also a member of the board of the U.S. Tennis Association. We have Jermaine McCauley, who is Director of Campus Wellness and the former AD at Spelman College in Atlanta. And we have Pam Watts, the CEO of NURSA, which is really the umbrella organization that organizes a lot of the club and intramural activity in this country. And that's what I love about this panel is each of you sort of understands a different piece of the college sports puzzle. But Brian, let me, let me start with you. Um, what challenges do athletic departments face today in supporting NCAA teams, especially in those non-revenue sports? Well, thanks, Tom, and, and it's great to be with, with this great group of panelists. So, you know, the challenges are, are considerable. So uh, as I think most people know, the, the NCAA distribution to the membership was cut by uh, over 70% when the final floor was, was canceled. Um, there's going to be a lot of challenges going forward with championships. So, you know, there's a, there's a revenue model there and, and the revenues are, are, are not coming in. But I think if we take a step back, and, and I think we need to, it's not even about cutting sports. We're probably at a place where 20 to 30 percent of Division three schools may not survive this pandemic. And that's, that's a whole other thing that we need to think seriously about. And at the D3 level, 25 to 50 percent of students are actually student athletes. That's very different than say at a D1 school, Ohio State, where you may have 50,000 students, but only 700 student athletes. So, so it's a challenge and, and, and you know, we, we think about the economic uh, disaster that, that COVID brought with us in addition to the health and safety disaster. If we really wanted to open up our society and part of that is sport, which is a great metaphor for society, well, we didn't do it in the way that maybe could have happened. We don't have still a, a good national syndromic surveillance system. We don't have a national oversight of contact tracing or testing. And so what's happened is that the, those with more money have been able to carry things out because they can afford what testing is available. And those without, they're, they're struggling. So, so that's one part of the picture. But the other part is when you look at the sports that are being cut, it's the Olympic sports the non-revenue sports. And one model, one opportunity is how do we make these sports relevant? And to make them relevant, you need to make them financially independent. And that's a unique relationship that could happen with the national governing bodies that they take a sport like tennis. It's not just about varsity tennis, but can there be tennis year round? And it even involves the community level, but it also involves uh, community tennis for college players, and, and it becomes financially sustainable. So, so I think we need to step outside of the box, not just look at the NCAA, and, and, but I think there may be a great opportunity in partnership with the NGBs and ultimately the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. The trend on cutting teams at the NCAA level, where it's headed, where do, if you could look into your crystal ball, Brian, where, where's it going to be in, say, five years. How is this thing going to ultimately play out? So again, uh, crystal ball projections. Uh, so what Division One did and, and other divisions as well, to, to call yourself an NCAA school, you have to have a certain number of sports. So we couldn't just keep cutting and so you only have two sports. And of course, those two sports would be the revenue sports of football and basketball. And most of the financial projections, and it's not just for the NCAA, it's for schools, it's for theater, um, is that things will probably start turning around in 2023. And so that seems like a long way away, and, and it really is so. But as a society, we're going to be struggling to, to keep up over the next couple of years. But 
Um, you know, so, but going back to the NCA, hopefully we have a final four this year and, and recall for the final four, most of it is just playing the game. If we play the game, you know, that takes care of the revenue for uh, the broadcast and so forth. You mentioned the minimum um, number of sports, 16 and D1. As things play out, can you see some pressure on maybe lowering that number? Well, look, there's always going to be pressure, right? And so the, 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 there's two types of pressure. There's a pressure from the student athletes and the parents and those voices that say, you just can't cut these sports because what's the essence of who we are? And then there's sometimes the pressure of the athletic directors or the athletics department saying, we just can't fund anything. So it's, it's balancing pressures and, and ultimately then you have the membership, which I think they understand the essence of the NCAA. It, it really is not about two sports. It's about 24 sports. So my hope um, is that that 24 sport vision is the one that prevails and, and we understand that we're going to really continue to be who we are and offering opportunities across the board, that that's where we'll land. Uh, it's not going to be easy. I mean, these economic realities are, they're, they're, they're stark. They're deep. Yeah. So Pam, let me ask you, all these NCAA program cuts by athletic departments, do these sports disappear or do they just transition into a, a club sport? And when they do transition, what does that mean? How does it differ from an NCAA team experience? Yeah, many of them transition to the to the club model, and it's it's a great model that still involves you know intercollegiate play. Um, it's differently funded and differently supported on campus, and I, I think there's there's pros and cons both ways. Um, in the club model, um, it's a lot more self-directed by the players. They have a lot more agency and expectation and responsibility around the organizing, you know, even the leadership within the club, their, their funding and fundraising. They're advised, of course, by a club sport professional on campus. They have to work within the rules of, of the university, which are largely around, you know, safety and risk management. Um, but there's a lot of great leadership development that goes on in the club model, um, you know, and especially at, um, you know, D1 schools, the clubs in those sports are highly, highly competitive. Um, it's, a, it's a great level of play for those high school athletes that, you know, maybe weren't going to, wanted to go to a D1 school for academic reasons, but weren't going to make a D1 team, and they can still really enjoy a high level of play. I will say in the transition, you know, it's, it's not all, you know, sunshine and ice cream. Um, you know, it is, it is different. Sometimes you get some pressure even from like the admissions office who's used to using, you know, a, a varsity sport as a recruitment tool. You certainly have an adjustment for those student athletes to be playing in a different model. Mm -hmm. So it's club and then there's also intramurals, which is a little mm -hmm. less serious, I guess. So, I mean, if you were to talk to a parent who's, you know, 12 year old or 14 year old is playing sports and you're going to try to convince them that, you know what club and intramurals are, mm -hmm. it's a great option. What would you say? You know, I think it's really about what you want out of your college experience and what's that balance of sport and academic and social activities and other, you know, clubs and organizations not sport related that you can join. You know, maybe you're going to be working through college doing internships and the like. And I think the different opportunities can give you different balance. So, you know, intramurals is, is the, the lowest lift, probably um, team sport participant experience. You know, you're playing on campus, you're not traveling, you're self-organizing you know maybe you play one in the fall it's not year round that kind of thing club is a little bit more you are traveling you are engaging with a league or an NGB maybe even playing for a national championship and then of course on up to a varsity model that you know, is a super high level of play really well supported by the university um, but also you know takes up a fair amount of time in your college experience and so as a parent and I'm a parent too of, of high schoolers one in particular that plays sport and so you know we talk about what do you want out of your college experience and what, what balance do you want out of these things? Um, you know, I think often parents who are just looking at a varsity model, you know, try to think through like a D1 versus a D3 experience because those have different levels. And I would just extend that out to the, the club and intramural model. Gotcha. And Jermaine, I'd like to bring you in here. So Spelman College, very small, historically um, black college and university based in Atlanta. In 2013, you moved away entirely from 
NCAA sports, dropped, took the money, put it into club and recreation, you know, uh, uh, and, and intramural type of activity. And now you, from what you're telling me the other day, you, you don't even have the intramural activity anymore. It's just all about fitness and recreation. Why, uh, why was this move made and what have been the outcomes? So, and thank you, first of all, for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so this move was made when uh, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, who is our, who was our, who's now our former president, um, just had a vision of not, you know, thinking that our students would not be going pro in athletics, and she wanted to focus on the entire campus and the entire student body. And so she transitioned. We went into what we call the wellness revolution in 2012 of November, which was the focus was to uh, get all of our student body and, and our Spelman community to become uh, healthy and having healthy lifestyles. And so upon that, we phased out athletics. Uh, we had seven sports. Uh, and we had a small uh, percentage based upon the complete student body of student athletes that played in that sport. We also were in the woes of deciding uh, about conference because our conference was dismantling um, as, you know, as a part of that. And so she felt that the money could be used to build a new state-of-the-art facility, which we have a beautiful facility that is really focused on, um, you know, fitness and recreation. And uh, upon doing that, we created a number of uh, very viable programs um, in our wellness program that have been very um, great programs for our community. And so as a part of that, you know, we did have intramurals, and you are correct, in 2016, we started our uh, intramural program, but because we had a number of students who felt like they just wanted to, that it was more important to just have the recreational piece, in 2018, we decided to uh, phase it out. Um, our students, uh, they have a different perspective. And what have been the outcomes? Are, 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 is your student body healthier? Have you measured this type of thing? Are the people happier? Does it, has there been, been any impact, positive or negative, on admissions? What, what oh, you absolutely not. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we had, and, and even in our virtual environment, because we are virtual right now, um, we've had more applications to come in. Um, so spe that has not uh, impacted our, our admissions at all. As a matter of fact, I think it's made it better. To answer your question, I, I, um, the outcomes, our campus is getting healthier and uh, they are happier. Uh, you know, I have to talk about when I was the AD, all of this happened during my time. And so, you know, when, you, when you've been in athletics, you've been an athlete, you've played it, and then you see something become phased out, you have to think, how's this really gonna work? And I have to say, <laughs> that I am very pleased with the uh, way this whole wellness revolution, the whole wellness program has really turned out. Our students uh, are really buying into understanding the dimensions of wellness and how they all come together to help them in their life. It's a part of helping them to matriculate while they're matriculating to maintain healthiness and what that means to them as they move out into the world they are change agents for our, their families, for their friends. And so in our uh, wellness department, we have a wellness curriculum. Once we phased out physical education, it was important to maintain a wellness curriculum where our students would still be able to take classes. And these are not for credit, they are pass fail. But in our classes, in our wellness curriculum classes, uh, they do get a lot of education about, you know, fitness and nutrition and what that means in, for mind, body, and spirit. How can NCAA athletic departments best support mm -hmm. for participation in the student body, you know, broadly? So, I mean, is it a matter of 
opening up facilities uh, for club teams and intramurals? Is it a matter of providing trainers, you know, to guide people on best practices or what can be done? And Brian, I'd like to get your thought on this as well. Yeah, and I, I just, I also want to comment, you know, what you hear from Jermaine there is what a good job Spellman did listening to their students and their student needs. And, you know, I think you're demonstrating this well on this panel. This is not one size fits all. Right. And so you need to be listening to your students. What type of sport experiences do they want? How many different types of sport experiences do they want or not? So to your question around, you know, how can, you know, maybe the club or club and intramural, you know, side of the house collaborate with the varsity side of the house. Um, there's great opportunity. You know, we do see collaborations. Um, um, especially at the medium to small schools with facilities, with staffing. Um, in recent years, the access to athletic trainers, especially around concussions, when all of that became a much bigger deal in the last five or six years, we saw great collaborations where the um, athletic department was offering that expertise, some of those resources to the club athletes. Um, we've also seen um, some good collaborations around the leadership development and recognizing that these student leaders are, are leaders on campus. So for example, um, several years ago, the, the NCAA did some great work around inclusion for LGBT athletes. And as they rolled out their program on campuses, the more forward thinking campuses invited not just the varsity athletes, but also all of the club athletes to participate in that learning. They did a similar thing, um, the NCAA did with uh, some work they had done around gender-based violence, right? Same thing, like the resources of the NCAA can put together some great programs, but let's, you know, they worked with NERSA to deliver it to a wider audience. We, we know that students on college campuses um, support NCAA programs to the tune of like about a billion, a little over a billion dollars a year and student fees go to the athletic departments. How can athletic departments you know, continue to help students feel good about some kind of return on investment. Is there anything that Pam said, for instance, that resonates with you? Yeah, I think I, I'll, I'll follow up on what Pam was saying. And I, I, I think there's a lot of opportunities and, and even the student athletes. So the student athlete advisory committee members, they really want to serve as role models for what it means to be a combination of a student and an athlete. And that doesn't necessarily mean an NCAA varsity athlete. So a couple other uh, ways So we talk about concussion, when, when you look at our concussion protocols, they're, they're really not, uh, they're, well, they're resource independent. So they can serve as a model for any club sport or any way of doing sport. The same thing for our mental health best practices, which, which actually the, the International Olympic Committee took the NCAA mental health best practices and said, this should be the foundation for a model for sport across the world. And, and so with the mental health, I think that's a way to, to get into all club sports or intramural sports, however we want to do it. We have actually coming up um, in October, um, another summit on, um, and, and this is gonna be on transgender sport participation. And it really brings up two very, very important points. One is how can we create an inclusive environment but how do we actually do sport fairly at the most elite level? And I, and I think that's important to, to state as well. So I don't think we necessarily are looking for a model where it's all equal and everyone can do club sport because there's something actually pretty fantastic about achieving at the elite level and even going professional. So support them all, but let them interdigitate. So I, I fully expect from the Transgender Summit where we're going to be addressing some you know, sometimes some, some tough issues for trans females. Are they taking away from Title IX opportunities, from high school athlete opportunities, or are they really broadening the inclusion environment that we so desperately need in our country? So all of these things, I think the NCAA can share broadly. And then another is not just at D2 and D3. There are some prominent D1 schools where the athletic trainers and the athletic training facilities are not just for NCAA athletes, they're for all club sport athletes. Now that's not an NCAA decision, that's a university decision, but I think we you know, need to think outside of the box. The universities can think outside of the box and the NCAA can begin to think more broadly about how their best practices can apply to all sports at, at all levels. The US Tennis Association 
has formed a, a really robust partnership with NURSA, your organization, to develop tennis on campuses. So tennis actually is the sport that may have seen the most program cuts recently, but I'm not hearing the agonizing from the USTA that you hear from other NGPs because they seem to have kind of under, they understand the opportunity here in the, in this dislocation. Can you talk about that partnership? Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the beautiful things about the USTA is, you know, overall they want as many people as possible playing tennis cradle to grave. Right. And so they want all the channels, you know, robust. This isn't just about an Olympic team or just about, you know, the pro circuit or just about the U.S. Open. You know, my experience with them is they've always treated, you know, the U.S. Open is very important. It's a big source of their revenue. But really, then they are to take that and grow the sport of tennis. And so they came to us about 20 years ago. Um, you know, interested in growing the non-varsity collegiate space for tennis. And we did some early programs in intramurals and then quickly pivoted to club because there was a little more action around club at the time. Um, you know, our first national championship 20 years ago was eight teams, you know, competing in a, a national tournament and it quickly grew to, to 64 and got capped. And so they partnered with us because they knew we had the expertise on how to engage club athletes and intramural athletes, which is a little different than varsity athletes. It's a different mindset. It's a little bit of a different culture. Um, and they, you know, along the way, they had to, you know, be flexible with, with some of their rules. You know, for example, it's a very tried and true thing for most NGBs to require membership of their athletes, right? And, you know, we lobbied and said, look, if you do this, you won't grow. You won't achieve, you know, the things you want to achieve. And so they were willing to flex on that and had great results. Part of tennis that other um, sports, if possible, um, can consider is they made it fun. And part of the way they made it fun was they used the world team tennis format, which is a co-ed team format, right? Yes, you know, women are playing women and mixed doubles and men are playing men, but all those points roll up to a team format and the, the men and the women travel together. Um, it's, it's a co-ed space, which at the collegiate level, you know, just adds some fun and variety to the whole experience. Um, I want to close with your thoughts on using those human resources to make the world a better place, making the sports world a better place, right? So one of the webinars that we hosted this summer, we, uh, we talked about a new program called Tennis for America. that uses national service programs to recruit college tennis players to do a post-grad year of teaching tennis and mentoring in underserved communities. The founder of that program, John Bridgeland, the former White House advisor, says that this could be done in other sports as well. He would love to scale it, lacrosse for America, et cetera. Your thoughts on the promise of that type of program? Let's start with you, Brian. Oh, I think it's a great opportunity. You, you know, so often, uh, you know, anyone who's playing sport, they, they love sport. And, and so if you're a soccer player, you really love soccer. And, and sometimes, you know, you go to college and you aren't really sure what you're majoring in too often. Um, students will, will major in something just to get by. But to be able to give back to your sport for a lifetime, and, and we need to think about giving back to sport on an educational and business model for, for all sports. And again, that's a way if we're all collaborating and we get out of our silos and, and, and work together. And then what happens is we turn the focus to youth sport. And that's where we really need to go. And, and so and ideally, and, and this is what Project Play did so well, they understood that at the youth sport level, it should be equal access for everyone. Well, Brian, Pam, and Jermaine, thank you. It was an amazing conversation. Uh, I think it's got people thinking, and I really appreciate the, uh, you taking a moment to spend with us. Thank you to all our speakers this morning. We're going to take a short break now, but if you'd like, again, if you want to move your body, please join us on Facebook for a Box Blast, where trainers from Box for Kids will be leading a 15-minute session. Another option, after the Box Blast, please join me in a live Zoom room hosted by the Play Sports Coalition, a new Project Play champion, which has developed an advocacy platform tailored to policymakers that aligns with many of the ideas in our call for leadership. Each day, we're exploring one plank of the Project Play platform for action. Today, we want to know what you think about giving every child a right to play sports as a means of growing access and quality. 
Then we'll go deeper on that topic in the 1 p.m. Eastern hour of our programming, when Athletes for Hope founder Ivan Blumberg will talk with several athletes about what should be included in any children's rights and sports statement. I'll also talk with U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee CEO Sarah Hirschland about the role of the Olympic movement in improving the delivery of sport for youth. See you soon.